Uh, the motivation behind making this video segment was a conversation that I had with one of the students in the uh, rocket design capstone project recently. Uh, suppose that we have a rocket that is uh, under a thrust and accelerating in a given direction, as shown on the left-hand side. Now, because this is accelerating, the uh, expression that determines the acceleration is coming from Newton's second law, so force equal to mass times acceleration, as you have shown on the right side. But notice that nothing in this structure is fixed, okay? Because it's a, it's a moving object. Now, it is very common that uh, people uh, know that this, this shell, the rocket shell is in compression, but nothing is fixed, and therefore they treat it as if it's being uh, uh, compressed uniformly as shown on the left, which essentially means that you are they're clamping, they're clamping the, the nose cone, and uh, that makes it equivalent to what's seen on the left. Now, what we like to do is to show in this, uh, in, 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 in this uh, segment that uh, the, the, the compression force in the rocket shell is actually not uniform. And to do that, I will go to the following few slides. Okay, so why don't we make a cut at a certain location uh, before the nose cone, as shown here. For example, I made a cut along the way, somewhere halfway along the way, and draw the free body diagram here. So there is a thrust acting on the left side, there is a axial force acting on the right side, and there is acceleration of that piece of the rocket which has a little mass M, not big mass M, big mass M is the total rocket, but little M which is the mass of that uh, uh, piece on the, on, on the left. Now, Newton's second law gives you that the sum of all the forces equal to mass mass of that object, which is little m, times acceleration. If you rewrite this, you're going to get the acceleration, uh, you're going to get the axial force at the cut, namely f, equal to t minus ma. Now, where, if the cut is made very close to the, the engine, where uh, the mass of the, the little piece that is taken is very small, or let's say zero, then the axial force is the same as the thrust. But if the cut is made at the nose cone, at the tip of the nose cone, then the, the little m actually is the entire mass of the, the, the rocket, big M. And if you plug it in that expression, you're going to get axial force equal to zero. The moral of the story is that the axial force is not uniform through this, uh, through this uh, uh, rocket shell. And this is exactly what... Uh, uh, Mm, what do you call uh, inertia, uh, inertia relief is yes, basically. So uh, what we do is we uh, the, the actual the actual force distribution is shown here: a maximum at the the engine, a zero at the nose cone, nose cone, and uh, the idea behind uh, the inertia relief. Is uh, there's, there's two ways that uh, I'm going to demonstrate in this uh, in, in this video segment. One is method one that you actually have to manually uh, perform this operation. You apply the thrust at the rocket engine, the bottom, and then you calculate the acceleration of the rocket based on force over total mass of the the rocket. And these two actually equilibrate each other because mass times acceleration is equal to t. We are essentially treating MA as a force, as an equilibrating force. And uh, uh, the problem is that this structure is not fixed. And therefore, somehow you have to apply restraints, where, uh, which is called one, two, three rule, and it has to be done manually, if you go that route. The problem is that this can be messy, you have to have some practice, and it requires some thinking and trial and error. The other way is doing it by, uh, let, the, let the software handle that, the clear handle that. You apply the thrust and you tell the software that this thrust is actually coming, think about it as a, uh, an in, uh, equilibrated with an inertial, inertial force, MA. And this is called self-balancing. You know, we declare it in Katia 
as this thrust being a self-balancing load. In other words, apply the inertia, uh, inertia relief uh, automatically instead of you doing it as in method one. Now, again, you have to apply the one, two, three rule because, uh, uh, because although, although uh, the, the thrust and the inertial force are the same as far as the number goes, but there is no restraint. And this is what we call one, two, three rule, and in Katia, it's called isostatic restraint. Just to point, point out where you declare this as self-balancing force, if you uh, left click, double click on, uh, uh, on, 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 on the branch load, the Starlog box opens up, and then you declare it as self-balancing, and of course you say yes, okay? So I'm gonna do this problem for you. Uh, as a concrete example, with this fictitious or fake uh, rocket, uh, the, the dimensions are in meters and it's made of aluminum and the thickness of this uh, thing, this, this shell is uh, uh, about five millimeters and the thrust of 400 Newton is applied. Now, this is a dummy fake, uh, fake rocket because I'm assuming that inside of this is completely hollow, which is not the case. In a real rocket, there is uh, there's the fuel and there is equipment and instruments and things like that. Okay, so let's go ahead and do this problem. Uh, let me minimize that. Katia. Uh, oh, this video segment is going to be broken into two. The first one is let Katia do that automatically for you using self-balancing uh, load, and then in the second video segment. I will do that manually because uh, uh, there's a few, uh, a few uh, 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 not so obvious steps that you have to go through in order to do that manually. But it is helpful because you get to learn what's going on. All right, so let's start with the uh, art file. There we are. Uh, on, the, on the horizontal plane, on, on the vertical plane, I will sketch what you saw there as uh, the cross section, the cross section of the uh, the cross section of this thing that's going to get shafted. So uh, let's see now what's the best way of doing this thing. So I will draw a vertical line here, and there, and there. Okay, and then we put the dimension properly. So this one is uh, half a millimeter, 0.5. So half a meter, 0.5 meter. And this one is 0.4, I believe it was point, uh, can see 0.4, yeah, 0.4 meter. And this piece is, if I'm not, if I'm not drawing 0.05, 0.05 meter. Okay, now when you go to the top, when you go to the top, uh, you see for a second. Yeah, I can draw a straight line here, but I decided to use a spline. The actual dimension of that thing is not important. It's going to be, let's try it again. Uh, let's see now, spline from here to there, and then you close it. Hopefully it's a close curve and uh, it is. Okay, so let's uh, shaft this thing about that axis, and there is our rocket, okay? And uh, let's shell it out, get the shell over here, uh, 0 0.05, 0 0.005, that was the thickness of the shell, oops. Uh, let me see, what did I do, cancel. Uh, face to remove, okay, let's try it again, let's try again, uh, shell, uh, remove this face, 0 0.005, there we are. Okay, uh, one thing that I do need is actually this area because instead of applying a thrust there as a force, I'm going to apply it as a pressure on that area. So let's see now, if you go here to measure this, in millimeter is for, uh, 1492 millimeter squared, okay? If I use the, if I use meter 
uh, meter square as the uh, unit of area. Uh, this will round it into point, uh, uh, point zero zero one, okay, meter squared instead of point zero zero one four nine. So I use millimeter here and uh, uh, just so that we have we don't have any rounding involved. Or you have to increase the accuracy of display uh, on uh, uh, of the area. Okay, this is fine. Now let me hide this. Immediately, we're going to save it. File, save management. I already created a folder. Uh, save as uh, rocket in flight, part one. Say OK. And let's apply, uh, let's apply uh, material to it. Apply material, metal, aluminum on that part. OK. And uh, yeah, that's uh, pretty much it. Okay, I uh, I also uh, I also may need uh, will need for the second second video I need the mass of this because remember I have to calculate the acceleration, but uh, this can wait until the second video segment. All right, uh, right. Now we're gonna go to analysis and simulation. Generative structure analysis. It's a static analysis, although the rocket is in is in uh, uh, in motion. But uh, the whole idea behind inertial relief is that you treat as a static problem where you apply the thrust and MA inertial force in the other direction. So we do solve it as a static problem. Also, let's change let's change this element size to uh, point uh, point o two linear because you want to run it fast and if you look at the size you make it a little bit smaller 0.01 maybe okay if you want to look at the mesh it's right there change the rendering to with edges and there is the elements now this problem is probably more appropriately done as shell elements instead of solid elements. However, because the uh, uh, because the the only force that is pre present, pretty much the only force that's present is axial force. There's no bending involved. Solid will do fine, no problem. Okay, let's deactivate that. All right, first thing we're going to do is uh, we're going to apply we're going to apply a pressure here, a pressure. So we're going to apply a pressure uh, edit formula. Uh, it's a 400 newton, 400 newton divided by that area. This area that we uh, let's see now. This area that we did the calculation that we did here. Okay, that guy, that guy. If you put this thing, the unit of this is going to be kilopascal. So uh, Newton over millimeter squared is going to give you kilo kilopascal, and uh, there we are, 268 kilopascal. Okay, and the support is this: you apply the pressure on this uh, circular region. Okay, good. Now, uh, what do we do here? If you look at your load, you apply the load right there, right there. See pressure right there. But if you uh, left click, double click on this line which says load, this dialog box opens up and it says this is self-balancing load. In other, in other words, should the software apply inertial relief? The answer is yes. And then you have to change this thing to yes. So we say okay. All right. And if I run this thing, it's going to bomb out because there is nothing. There is nothing that uh, restrain, uh, restrains this uh, uh, this rocket. So uh, let, let me show you. If you run it, it's going to bomb out. And if you want to make, you want to see how. For example, we can plot the deformation and animate it. You see that it's moving as a rigid body. Okay. So we need to apply the inertia relief. However, Katia. Uh, inertial relief means that you have to apply the one, two, three rule, not the inertial, 
the, the one, two, three rule. Uh, but uh, we don't want to do that. I want to do that in the second video segment for you. What we need to do is let Katia do that automatic, automatically for you, and that's this. If you look at the restraint, the last one is user-defined restraint, and you expand it, you get the second icon, which is isostatic restraint. You click on it, and it automatically imposes the one, two, three rule at uh, uh, three, three locations, three nodes, okay? We don't know which one, although, after you run it, you can see where it applied it. It's not a, it's not an issue because we don't care, but uh, it's a good idea to, uh, to 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 make sure that it's there. It is there. So let's run it. Notice that it didn't bomb out this time, and you can plot the uh, von Mises stress right there and change the rendering to material shading uh, right there. So you can see that the von Mises stress, which is very close to the, you know, axial stress in this case, because it's only axial deformation, is not uniform, as you can see, okay? It is a varying biggest, uh, biggest uh, uh, axial stress at the bottom, and then it gradually reduces to zero on the top. Okay, now, a couple of things here. And that is, oh, I told you that it is possible to see where the one, two, three rule is applied. So if you go to, uh, if you go to uh, loads, uh, sorry, restraint, and you put the cursor on isostatic right there, right there, you put a cursor there, right click, and say restrain visualization on the mesh. You click on it. It's kind of hard to see it here, but if you change the rendering to uh, wireframe, then it may be easier to spot it. So let's see now, let's zoom in. There is one place, there is one node where all three degrees of freedom have been fixed. Fixed mean that there's, zero. and it's right there. You see that? I didn't do this. This particular node, the displacement in three directions are zero. Now there's another place where uh, two directions are zero. I think the one with one direction zero, I know that it's, it's right up, oh, right, right there actually, you can see that. This is the place where two directions, the degree of freedom at these two directions are zero at that node. That's what isostatic does. And there's a third one where only one of them is fixed. Now, that may be hard to find, but believe me, there's another one. And if you look close enough, we can find it. Let's just give it a few seconds, see if we can identify. Uh, Let's see. Unfortunately, there is no fast way of doing it. You have to look and eventually you'll find it. But uh, I, I'm not very successful in finding it right now. But you get the picture, okay? So uh, I will stop this video segment and we'll do the second one uh, immediately after this. But uh, uh, what did I want to tell you is, um, uh, right, let's, uh, let's activate actually the, uh, the uh, von Mises stress. Right there. And change the rendering to material shading. So uh, there we are. So just remember this uh, distribution here going from 0 to 270 kilopascal because we should be getting... If we do that manually, we should be getting roughly the same uh, same numbers. Okay, uh, that's it. The second video is coming.